Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll pull out your bulletin insert with the lessons on it. Um, Just kind of want to talk a little bit about uh, how they're arranged today and and some of the things that uh, came to mind as I looked at them this week and with our uh, pastor's conference, uh, our topic being closed communion there. But uh, just some comments. Uh, Quite often in the pericope system, in our liturgy, uh, you have the, they they try to work all the texts together usually, but oftentimes they can't do that. And so they generally try to make at least the gospel lesson, the Old Testament lesson, uh, have some connection. And if any text goes on its own, it's the epistle lesson usually, which goes on its own. Uh, Sometimes there's what's called uh, lectio continua, um, a continuous reading from a particular epistle book that will be, you'll notice there'll be, you know, Galatians, you'll get a bunch of Galatians four, five, six weeks in a row, this sort of thing. Uh, we have a, something similar here today. The epistle lesson in some ways doesn't match what's being spoken, but in some ways it does, as I'll make a note of it later here. But uh, first in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what what's, were the, uh, those who put together the church calendar and the um, pericope system, what were they looking at in Genesis 50 and Matthew 18? Genesis 50, of course, is the account of, as you had the picture reminded of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brethren, and this is when they find out down the road that now Joseph is Pharaoh's number one guy. He is the most powerful, next to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in all of Egypt. And they're standing in front of him and they're worried because they sold him into slavery. And uh, I'd be worried too. Um, if he's holding a grudge, they could be in big trouble. And so, but the text goes on and tells us what? that uh, Joseph forgives them. Um, Don't be afraid, I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And notice reassure, that word assurance is found in the word to assure, to reassure. And so uh, he reassures them that he's not going to uh, do them harm, but rather uh, is going to plan to bless them. And uh, so... Genesis 50 is an example, isn't it, of forgiveness. Joseph forgiving his brothers for their sin against him. And uh, fits very nicely, doesn't it, with the gospel reading today, Matthew 18, where Peter comes and says, "Uh, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And I think Peter thinks he's being generous up to seven times. Now, how many of us would get up to seven? Uh, I think we fail after once most of the time. But up to seven times, and the Lord says, and this is not, he's not giving him a math equation, so be counting, Peter, when you get 76, you only got one more. But the point here is, no, abundantly, constantly, continuously forgiving. And uh, the parable that is given there, of course, is what? Making the point of how God forgives us. And Jesus tells this parable that uh, that uh, God has forgiven us like the master who forgave his servant the debt of $100,000, to use modern lingo, and yet this guy does what? After he's forgiven a debt of $100,000, he goes and finds his brother's servant who owes him five bucks, and he throws him in prison. There's something wrong about this. huh? And even the fellow servants recognize this, and they go talk to the master. The point being, of course, is if the Lord forgives us again and again and again, and we owe him more than anybody could owe us, we've offended the Lord uh, more than we've offended, anybody's offended us, then we ought to be able to forgive others. We confess this, don't we, in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And so uh, both texts... Uh, actually are speaking then of of the abundant forgiveness that God bestows upon us, but then that forgiveness which we are to share with uh, those who offend us. Now, there are some complexities in the text, and this is why I'm taking a little bit of a time to exegete, to interpret these texts a little bit, because if you hear them uh, without that, uh, you might get some wrong ideas. And so, uh, one of the things I've mentioned is oftentimes there's two truths of Scripture, and here's a good example of this, and you don't want to kind of misapply these texts. 
And, and so a key thing for me here, and helping me understanding quite often these texts, is Luther's distinction between office and person. Office and person. And I would argue the Genesis text and the Matthew 18 text are talking about you in your person. You as a person. In your heart of hearts. Who you are. Okay? Not in regard to any particular office you might have. And so, uh, this particular text, notice things that are being said here. Uh, In Genesis uh, text, Joseph says something amazing. Am I in the place of God? And in this context, the answer is no. But let's say this is somebody coming with a problem that has been done recently in the kingdom, broken the law. Would he say, am I in the, what would be the answer to, am I in the place of God? The answer would be, yes. Yes. Right? Go back and read Romans 13. The government is what? Ministers sent by God. God's representatives. Um, holy ministry is like this too, right? A few moments ago you heard about it. In the stead. In the stead. In the place of. And by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. The pastor is in the place of God. That's what we confess. Not in his person, but in his office. And so we have to make sure that we are always distinguishing between person and office. Okay? It's the same way here, I would argue, with the uh, Matthew text. When Jesus is talking about how many times do you forgive, he's talking about in your person, not in your office. Uh, sorry, kids, that means that if you do something wrong, your parents can ground you. Or as I used to like to say, if my kids say to me, turn the other cheek, I'll tell them, no, you turn the other cheek, I'm going to fan that one too. Although I don't know if we can get away with that anymore in our society, but the point's still valid. In other words, as a parent, you have an office. You forgive your children in your heart, in your innermost being, you love them and care, but you might have to do what? You might have to discipline. There might be a consequence. And so, because why? Because you are in the place of God. God has made you the repre- His representative to your children. By the way, that's a great joy, but also a huge responsibility, isn't it? It puts a whole different light on how I think we raise our children. If you're God's representative to your children, you represent God, that means you should always be asking what? How does God want me to raise my children? What's His goal for my children? Okay, Because yes, as parents, you are in the place of God. Otherwise, He wouldn't have had you be parents. But this is how God works. Through means. Through offices. Ah. Uh, But this text is talking about in your heart of hearts. Uh, By the way, you see this in many ways. Uh, I make the point, uh, if you remember in the old cowboy movies, The Hanging Judge, right? And he would say what? I'm going to hang you, you know, until you're dead, but may God have mercy on your soul. They got it. What was up with that? I got to do this in my office, but this is not personal. I don't wish you ill will at all, because I know, save for the grace of God, there go I. But as God's representative, I have to do this. Uh, This is confirmed in Jesus' discussion with Pilate. If you recall when he talks to Pilate. uh, Pilate says, do you not know that I have the authority to kill you, crucify you? And Jesus doesn't say something like, well, all killing is wrong. No. Doesn't argue with him at all about that point. In fact, he says what? You would have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. And what's he telling Pilate? You do stand in the place of God. Use your authority right, properly. Because you will be held accountable on how you use your office. But yes, Pilate, you have that office. I'm not denying it at all. In fact, you notice that in the parable, you have that very same thing. 
in the parable. It, it doesn't stand out, but think about it, right? Uh, Jesus doesn't say, well, at the end of the parable, well, the master was wrong for ter- turning this other servant over to the jailers. He should have forgave him and let him go his way. No. He says what? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured. And Jesus is okay with that. Why? Difference between office and person. It comes up in uh, Jesus' teaching, the two truths of office and person. On the one hand, where Jesus says, turn the other cheek. If it's to your person, you go the extra mile. You do whatever it takes, you forgive. But the same Jesus did what? Makes a whip and chases everybody out of the temple. What's up with that? The difference between person and office. In fact, the text goes on and tells us what? That the disciples remembered that zeal for his house would consume him. And he's doing this as God's representative. In our Old Testament account, Joseph's saying, what you did to me was a personal thing. I have no authority over that. And I have to forgive you. And he does. But even when you hold an office and you have to do something, you do that office in God's stead. Not as, boy, I'm going to have joy in this. Isn't this a great thing? Eh, maybe you heard this from your parents. This is going to hurt you more than hurt me more than hurt you. Maybe it hurts you. Right? But what do I mean by that? I don't want to do this, but I have to discipline you. And that's the same idea, too. So there's a difference between office and person involved in here. God's forgiveness is in our person to be constant and continuous. But there are times in the civil realm, but also in the spiritual realm, where forgiveness is withheld. So, for example, Jesus says what? Whosoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven unto him. Does he stop there? No. He goes on and says what? And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The office sometimes has to say what? You're in impenitence. You're in impenitence. You are not forgiven. Because of your impenitence, you're blocking the forgiveness that Christ wants to bestow upon you. And I can't affirm that to you until the impenitence is gone. Um, And so, in the church, this is true, too, uh, where uh, we we want to forgive, uh, always want to forgive, should forgive what's being done to you. It's not personal. But the office sometimes will have to speak in a different way. Um. This comes up, and I mentioned we had at our circuit or at our uh, district pastors conference uh, discussion on uh, closed communion. And it was kind of interesting that one of the texts that was brought up was the Romans 14 text, uh, because basically the position of our church body has historically been, and I would argue it's not just our church body; it's it's been historically, it's always been up until probably 200 years ago, the practice of closed communion, and that you commune those who are in agreement with your teachings and full agreement, at least as far as what they know. Um, And um, uh, somebody said, well, but there's texts that seem to suggest that, uh, you know, can't we all just get along type thing, that you can have different opinions. And this was the text that was quoted. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. And the point being is, whichever way you want to go, you pick your choice. But be, con- but be convinced in your own mind what you're doing is right and proper. And so this person was trying to suggest that that's how things should be, and this is confusing. Well, again, just as office and person can be confusing until you recognize those distinctions, here I would argue there's a distinction involved. What Paul's talking about, if you take a look at Romans 14, is he's talking about what's called adiaphora, a uh, big word, but it means things neither commanded nor forbidden in God's word. There is what God's word has said, and there are things where God has left it to our Christian freedom to decide. Um, <clears throat> God tells you to raise your children, bring them up. He doesn't tell you exactly all the time what, how to do that in any particular instance. And so parents will use different techniques. They're okay. Um, but we are to do what? The goal is what? To raise our children up in the fear of the Lord. Um, this, can, this has just many issues. But this particular one, I would argue, if you read the context, I think this is talking about Paul's dealing with what? Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles who are coming into the church 
who could never be in the church before, God's church, and Jews and Gentiles, and they're trying to figure out, what does this mean? And how's this going to impact what we do? And what does the fact that the Messiah has arrived mean to all the things that are in the Old Testament that we're pointing forward to him? Do we still have to keep them? And I think what he's talking about here is actually the Sabbath day and some of the feasts of the Old Testament. He's talking about, two clean and unclean food laws. Um, and what he's saying is, at that point, basically, there were people who, you know, hey, if you've, if you've all your life avoided eating pork, it's pretty hard to start eating pork. And Paul's saying, that's okay. But don't you judge the person who now knows what? That that doesn't count anymore. That that's not required. And so the context of this, I would argue, is the Jewish-Gentile exchange of the worldviews that's going on here and the passing from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And Paul's saying, these are things that are now adiaphora. In the Old Testament, Sabbath was not adiaphora. It was a command of God. You had to keep it. There was no, no do whatever you want. In the Old Testament, eating pork was forbidden. There was no do whatever you want. But with the advent of the New Testament and the fulfillment that these things have been fulfilled, the game has changed. And Paul's trying to teach what? That we're to live and love for the Lord. And where the Lord has not bound us to something, we can't bind people. But where the Lord has spoken, that's a different story. And so, you know... (laughs) What we're talking about when we're talking about fellowship with things is doctrinal fellowship. Are you teaching the same things? Are you in agreement with the doctrinal content of the Scriptures? And part of this, by the way, too, I would argue, fits in with what we're talking about here with regard to forgiveness, and that is repentance. Uh, We give the gospel to those who repent. And impenitence requires us to withhold the gospel until they repent. It's the office of the keys. It's what Christ has given to his church. And when we practice closed communion, in a sense, we're doing that. Now, there's a tension here. We have two truths again, and we want to confirm both of them. One truth is what? The Holy Christian Church. Lutherans have always taught, have always believed, that there is There are believers in all denominations that are Christian-based. In other words, the old joke that Lutherans think they're the only ones going to heaven is wrong. Lutherans have never believed that. They've always confessed. What we confess in the creed, I believe in one holy Christian church. Notice we say, I believe it. Not I see it. I believe it. Because we know that God, what? We're His means of grace. These means of assurance we're talking about. Where they're going on, the Holy Spirit can create faith. So we believe that. That's one truth. And we have to confess that and acknowledge that in whatever way we we can. But there's another truth that comes into play here when you're talking about fellowship issues. And that is the truth of the Scriptures where you have things like avoid false prophets, flee them. Or a little yeast leavens the whole lump when it comes to doctrine. If you buy into one false teaching, it's going to lead to another false teaching, the idea. And that's a holy truth of Scripture, too. And we have to take that one just as seriously as we take the Una Sancta, the Holy Christian Church, and that belief. And so how that plays itself out is this. And by the way, you can be impenitent, not just in life, but in doctrine, right? In fact, according to the ranking of stuff, Which is of higher value, life or doctrine? First table of law or second table of law? So we always always reverse it. But really, God wants what? Us to keep the doctrine straight. You get the doctrine straight, life will take care of itself, right? You can't reverse them. But both, you can be impenitent in both ways. You can say no to the Lord in lots of ways. And one way is to say, Lord, I'm not going to believe that. Even though you tell me it's true, I'm not going to believe that. And that's impenitence. That's impenitence. Um, And so when we practice communion fellowship, the reason why we don't commune just everybody and anybody is because although we believe on the one hand the truth that the Holy Christian Church is made up of Christians of all denominations, on the other hand, if they're coming to my altar, they're still part of a church that's teaching falsely. And I don't know whether they are what we call erring ingenuously, 
that is, innocently because they don't know the truth, or whether they're stiff-necked proponents of error. And a stiff-necked proponent of error is someone, doesn't matter what the Lord, you show them what the Lord has said, they don't care. That's called impenitence. And because of that, I can't commune them. I have to say, we have to talk. We have to talk. Because as much as I want to uphold the unisanta, and I believe in that, and I want to confess that, I also have to be what? Aware of false prophets. Avoiding them. Recognizing a little yeast leavens the whole lump. And so, the pastor is kind of, again, set in a place of authority in the stead of Christ, and he has to ask these questions. This is why we practice closed communion. Not because we don't believe other Christians aren't going to heaven. Not because we don't love other people. Not because even, you know, even when the church has to say no to a forgiveness at a pretty moment, it doesn't mean because you don't love them. We just saw that, right? You've got to forgive all the time. But in your office, last week we heard what? The watchman, right? The watchman. This is a, the pastor's the watchman. He's been played, paced here to cry out, hey, that's wrong, something's wrong, we've got to fix this. He's the watchman. And in his office, not in his person, but his office, he has to do this. This is why I ask, hey, come talk to me before you commune here. Because I've got to ask some questions. Because I have to know, before I'm dishing out the body and blood of Christ, his holy body and blood, as best as I can, I can't look into your hearts, but as best as I can from all visible, tangible things, that you're penitent and you desire forgiveness. It's always been that way in the church for 2,000 years. Always been in Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Its official position has always been. You cannot find me one place where it's ever been open communion. It's always been closed communion. That should say something. When the whole Christian church has practiced this up until 200 years ago. And uh, anyway, it is a recognition, I would argue, of distinguishing between office and person. And by the way, we started this with assurance. Be glad for the difference between office and person. Because if that difference didn't exist, you could have no assurance of your forgiveness. If the body and blood of Christ that I'm distributing depends upon my holiness, you're not got much assurance there, brothers and sisters, are you? Because there are such things as hypocrites. Right? Hypocrite does what? He looks good on the outside, but he's a false, he doesn't really believe. And you can never look into my heart and know whether I believe or not. You hope I do, as I hope you do. I take you at your word, but there are hypocrites. But it's based on the promises of God and the office he's placed. And now it's a different thing. And now you have what? Assurance. You find out some year, some way, uh, some time from now, that the pastor who baptized you was, uh, you know, wasn't a believer. You're scandalized by that. Should I be rebaptized? The answer is no. Because it wasn't based on his person. It was based on the office. And that gives us assurance. You see, God works through these things, but it's God working. And it is as certain as his promises. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I'm in the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ.